Megcram. Okay, welcome to another Megcram lecture. We're going to talk about mitral stenosis. We're going to talk about the features, the symptoms, the physical diagnosis, the diagnosis, treatment, and when to do surgery on mitral stenosis. So almost all mitral stenosis is related to rheumatic heart disease. Remember what rheumatic heart disease is? You have an infection, and then you have these antibodies that are floating around that would like to attack uh, bacteria, but instead they attack your valves. And specifically, we're talking about this mitral valve here. Typically, this occurs 20 years after rheumatic heart disease. And we usually see rheumatic heart disease in third world countries. For some reason in the tropics, it tends to occur more quickly. It's sped up than it does in the more northern latitudes. We're not exactly sure why that might be. But think about this in 30-year-old patients. It may be younger if you're talking about uh, in the more tropical areas of the world. You're going to see this in the 30-year-old patients because 20 years ago when they were 10, they may have had a rheumatic heart disease or, or um, some sort of a, uh, an infection at that time. So the symptoms are pretty straightforward. Basically, you're going to see uh, dyspnea, which is shortness of breath. You're going to see orthopnea, which is shortness of breath when you lay down. And you might see something called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea where they basically they wake up and they're all of a sudden short of breath. Sometimes you might actually see hemoptysis. This is because there's so much back pressure in the left atrium going back to the lungs that the small capillaries in the lungs actually rupture and you get like pink frothy sputum type of thing. So you might actually see hemoptysis with this but it's it's kind of rare. You don't expect to see that. Because the left atrium gets so large you might also see atrial fibrillation. And that usually occurs because you've got uh, a dilated atria. And because it's so dilated, sometimes you might even see thrombus in there. Sometimes, because this is so stenose, you might actually get a jet lesion in the left ventricle that can cause uh, problems. Sometimes the left atrium can become so large that it will actually splay the left main stem bronchus up and cause obstruction, and you can get pneumonia. So those are all uh, different possibilities that you can see in terms of symptoms from mitral stenosis. But the big one that you should know about is just shortness of breath, shortness of breath when lying flat, shortness of breath when laying flat at night and waking up, short of breath going to the window type of thing. I guess if you were to have a thrombus here, it got kicked off, it would go out into the systemic circulation and you could go up and get strokes, so uh, a CVA. Okay, so in terms of physical diagnosis, you're going to notice that the S1 is going to be louder. And uh, that's because of the stenosis of the mitral valve. Remember, when, the, when you have systolic uh, ejection of the left ventricle, you're going to have ejection of blood. It's going to close this. If it is relatively stenosed, it's going to cause a louder S1. The other thing you'll notice is, remember, the opening snap. The opening snap occurs at the beginning of diastole when the, uh, the mitral valve opens. The one thing I should say about the opening snap is that it occurs right after S2. So you have this thing called S2 slash OS. And remember, S2 marks the end of systole and the beginning of diastole. The key here is that if the opening snap occurs earlier, and there used to be trained physicians that could actually measure this into the hundreds of seconds, but suffice to say that if the opening snap is heard earlier, that means it's opening up early in diastole. And that could only mean, if it's opening up earlier, that there must be a bigger gradient across this valve. The bigger the gradient, the worse the uh, mitral stenosis. So let me review that. If you have bad mitral stenosis, the pressure in the left atrium is going to be much higher than that in the left ventricle in diastole. As a result of that, the opening sound or the opening snap is going to occur earlier. So earlier equals worse. Now the murmur itself is best heard at the apex. You may even want to get the patient in the left lateral decubitus position, but what you're going to hear is a low-pitched rumbling diastolic murmur. Rumbling. 
Okay, this is the same murmur that uh, you might want to call an Austin Flint if you're seeing aortic regurgitation. So low pitched diastolic rumbling murmur. What is going to make this larger? Anything that increases the amount of blood on the left side of the heart is going to make this bigger. So on exhalation, okay, that's going to do it. So an exhalation, you have a shift of the septum going to the left. The right side becomes bigger, the left side becomes smaller. So exhalation is going to make the sound larger. Things that will make the sound smaller would be a valsalva, because remember a valsalva makes the heart small on both sides. This is the murmur. Now, what else might you hear? You might hear a P2. Now, what, why might you hear a P2? Because if the pressure in here is built up, it's going to back up through the lungs into the pulmonary artery, which is going to make a larger sound than you would normally have. So you're going to have an increased P2. And as a result of that, you may also see, if it's been there for a while, right ventricular hypertrophy because you'll have elevated pulmonary artery pressures. So I think the keys here are that you're going to see an increased S1, you're going to hear an opening snap. The earlier the opening snap, the more severe the mitral stenosis. You're going to hear a low pitch rumbling diastolic murmur, and you may hear a P2 due to pulmonary hypertension and increased right ventricular lift from right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, let's talk about diagnosis. On EKG, what you'll see is enlargement of the RV and the left atrium. And you might see atrial fibrillation. So what do you see with an RV? If you look at the precordial leads like V1, V2, V3, you're going to see that the QRS complexes are going to be large. Okay. So those, think about right ventricular hypertrophy, the QRS complexes are going to be large in the precordial leads. In terms of left atrium, also look at V1, V2. And what you'll notice there is you'll see that there's a large up component and then down component before the QRS. If it's more than one small box up and one small box down, in terms of this measurement here on the P wave, that shows that there is a large left atrial size. Or of course you could have atrial fibrillation where there won't be any P waves at all. And that could be a sign that you've got mitral stenosis. Not very specific, but definitely something to pick up on. What about chest x-ray? Well, if you have your chest x-ray, you'll notice on the chest x-ray that sometimes you'll have this double bubble. So you'll have the heart border, and then behind it, right about here, you'll see another double density. That double density is actually the left atrium. I encourage you to go online and take a look at some x-rays of people with mitral stenosis so you can see it. It's almost pathognomonic, and you might see it on a test. The other thing you might see if the mitral stenosis is fair enough is you'll see what we call cephalization. So the pulmonary vasculature is going to be engorged, or you might see flat-out pulmonary edema. But the real key to diagnosis is echocardiogram once again. And with echocardiography, you're going to see a large left atrium, and you're going to see a mitral valve that does not allow flow to go through and there'll be a huge gradient here and, and that'll tell you that the Doppler on that echo will tell you the severity of the stenosis it's kind of a way of, of actually visualizing the pressure gradient and see the thing that leads to the early opening snap of course if that is the case the next step is cath because in this situation you can do surgery or treatment for for this so we'll talk about that now because the lungs are filling up with fluid and the patients are usually dyspneic we usually use loop diuretics, like Lasix. The other thing to do is, um, if you've got atrial fibrillation, you need to treat that. And so uh, anticoagulants, like Coumadin, and rate control. You want to keep the rate down, unlike in aortic insufficiency. And certainly if there are clots here, you don't want those clots to go through and embolize up to the brain. So anticoagulation will be key. Now, sometimes you can actually do balloon valvuloplasty. That's where you actually go 
go with the balloon and open this area up. That's usually effective um, if there's no calcification of the valve where things could break off and go and embolize or there's regurgitation. If there is regurgitation in addition to stenosis, then you want to go with valve replacement. So you can do balloon, valvuloplasty, or you can just do uh, what we call a mitral valve replacement. And remember, this is even more clot provoking than the aortic valve. And the reason is, is because across the aortic valve, you have very high flow. The mitral valve, on the other hand, is much bigger and therefore there's not as, as fast flow. It's very slow flow. And so this is very clot, clot forming. It's very high risk for clot forming. So you're gonna need anticoagulation if you do a mitral valve replacement, especially if it's mechanical. Sometimes they'll say even the INR must be between 2.5 to 3.5. And of course, if they stop anticoagulation, they have to be bridged, which can get a little dicey sometimes in terms of surgery. So that sums up mitral valve stenosis, the features, symptoms, pathophysiology, diagnosis, and treatment. Thanks for joining us.